very much for coming. Um, I will tell you a little bit about me and how effectively the book came about uh, in the first instance. Then I will touch upon the themes of the book, um, which have been, if you've been following the press, quite provocative uh, and controversial. Um, I know what it feels like to be chased by trolls on Twitter now. And so I'll be very keen on uh, finding out whether there are some real life trolls here today. <laughs> and, um, and then thirdly, I wanna just sort of get your thoughts um, from your own experiences, because what I have found is that in writing this book, that there's a lot of what I'm saying that resonates for a lot of people, no matter where they've come from and, and no matter what kind of life experience you've had. So that's essentially what I hope to do in the first sort of 25 minutes, and then we can open it up and then I will gladly sign your book as well uh, afterwards. So, um, a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Kenya to uh, Somali parents, and uh, we were growing up in a semi-slum called Isli in Nairobi. And my parents met in Kenya uh, about late uh, 1980. And my mother, uh, bless her, had, has given birth to 12 children. So I'm number eight in that long list. Um, I was glad she didn't stop after number seven, <laughs> but I wish she did after number eight. <laughs> and she had uh, got married and had the first six children with her first husband and the second six children with my father and one of my siblings, the younger siblings had died uh, when he was very, very small. And so they met in Kenya where they were living uh, for, throughout the 80s uh, when I was growing up there. And Roughly sort of when the war broke out in 1991, 92 in Somalia, so many of my family had moved over to Kenya seeking sort of some sort of refuge and help. And, and it was roughly around the time when the Dadaab uh, refugee camp had opened up in, in Kenya. And for my father, we were always now settled in Kenya where he had lived and he had started his life and had established himself. And we were going to stay there, certainly his children and my mother. And what was interesting about that was that I was the first person in my whole family's history to be born outside of Somalia, so to be born in Kenya. And for my father, that meant that our future was going to be in uh, Kenya for all intents and purposes. But when his mother, his sisters, and his other siblings all were fleeing the war from Somalia and came to Kenya, there was a choice to be made. There was a choice to be made as to whether or not they were going to seek asylum outside of, of Africa or stay in Kenya, or as most people were thinking at that time, the war's just gonna die down in a, in a bit and we'll just go back over and it's going to be fine. But then a lot of my siblings then sought asylum and I have brothers and sisters who ended up in America some ended up in Canada. I have cousins who ended up in Sweden, in Norway, and all sorts of different countries. And for my father, he, we were going to stay, and by this point, it's sort of like 92, 93. And then in 93, when the vast majority of my family had sought asylum where they could, my father died in a car crash in Kenya. So then that meant there was a, another choice to be made. At this point, my father's brother, was given a full scholarship to study and then work in Italy, where he was starting to establish himself and maybe start his own family. And he came back to Kenya to bury his, his brother, my father, and then there was another choice to be made there because he had to have a conversation with my mum and say, do you stay here with these kids? And my mum and father never learnt to read and write. They never were formally educated and they had to decide what to do. My uncle's advice was you're here with no income, with no real way of feeding these children. Either you follow this wave of people who are seeking asylum somewhere else in the world and try and find a new place to start again with help, or you stay here and nobody knows what's going to happen. You now have with you five children under the age of 12. And my mother said, well, okay, well, I think I could make it here, but leave the youngest one and take the rest, which meant that we 
the elder ones, ended up in London without our parents having just helped to bury our father. So you could just imagine for a moment being a nine-year-old boy or as my sister's six-year-old girl, five-year-old girl, turning up in a place like London without your mum, without your dad, not understanding the language. I'd like to think I've mastered the English language now a little bit. <laughs> not understanding the culture, not understanding anything about what's happening. Such was the shock for us that I still remember to this day, and I talk about it in the book, walking down the street and where I'd come from in the semi-slum in Nairobi, there were no street lights. When walking down the street and literally walking into a lamppost and knocking myself out as a child. That's just how different and new the environment was to us. And settling into a place like this when you don't understand the culture and the customs, when you don't have an adult to explain to you what's happening, why it's happening, what it means to be here, how it's going to work. All of those things can be really, really difficult. But here's the key point about that. That kind of beginning and that kind of start, for a lot of people like me, especially Somalis who came and sought asylum in this country, that was a really remarkably unremarkable thing. In fact, in many ways, we were lucky because we hadn't seen war. I had my, my father's sister, who had come to Kenya and then the UK to seek asylum, she had six kids of her, her, uh, of her own, but her husband had been killed in the war. And all of her children had experienced the war. At least with us, we hadn't experienced the war directly, but we were victims of the war indirectly. And so in that sense, the starting point was remarkably unremarkable in that sense. There was nothing special about the difficulties that we were facing at that time. Then what happens after that? Well, then it's my mum comes four years later and then we're having to sort of get to know your mum all over again because we now all speak English. She doesn't speak any English. You're trying to communicate with her. She's speaking to us in Swahili and Somali, which we understand, but not very well. And you can imagine all the difficulties that then that causes. I, I try and talk about it in the book as much as uh, detail as I can, but it was quite painful, as you might imagine, to sort of dig all that up and think it through and what it meant and why certain choices were made and why certain choices were not made and so on. But then, you know, I did enough to get to GCSEs, enough to get to the A-levels, enough to get to an undergraduate degree in law and French at the University of Hertfordshire. <sighs> I then got a full scholarship to do uh, my postgraduate uh, studies at Oxford University. Then I got a full scholarship to study for the bar exams in London. Then became a barrister, fully qualified in 2012. And then here I am now promoting this book that is telling that story. Now, you know, in many ways, it's a sort of shortened version. And people say, well, now it must mean that, you know, it's smooth sailing from here. Well, I mean, there's still plenty of time to mess this up, you know, I mean, it's not. It's not Let's not get carried away. Um, but it's that kind of journey that I, I'm still digesting in many ways. And I will continue to digest for quite some time because there's no shame in admitting that the pain and the sorrow and the grief will take a lifetime. And one of the ways in which a sociologist and a psychologist that I, uh, and a neuroscientist that I interviewed for the book and talked about were explaining how when grief, for example, or a traumatic event it's really important. Come on in. I trust you to be very late. Um, just one of those things that, you know, um, I know him. I'm not just picking up on him. Uh, I'm not just picking on him. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that people talk about when, um, you know, trauma or a, a death, for example, people always say, well, you'll get over it. And you'll get over it. But actually, one of the ways in which people explain that is, is they say, well, imagine your brain is just this one big sort of circle. When you're young and something very traumatic happens, like death, that particular event will be also another big circle within that brain circle of yours, because it will dominate a huge part of who you are. But as you go older and as you mourn properly and as you digest that trauma, 
that inner circle that signifies and represents that trauma just gets slightly smaller compared to that part of your brain that is there to be dealing with it. So in other words, you never get over it. It just becomes a smaller part of who you are, the contours of your life, the part of what makes you a, a whole human being. And that is, for, for me, the best way in which somebody described to me the way in which we deal with trauma and death and, and that kind of thing that happens to you in our life. So it's quite important that you don't always come across to people or say to somebody, well, you'll get over it, it's fine. Time will heal you. That's just not the right way to look at it. Because if you do, you're going to come up against the wall that hits you and hits you and hits you. So what about the book in terms of the themes? Well, the themes that I've, I've, I've looked into here are, are quite varied and big. So the book ranges from what is happening to you as a child and sort of what is happening to you in the womb of your mother and the kind of diet that your mother's having in terms of what kind of human being that you grow up to become all the way through to whatever fulfilling career you're looking for, whatever fulfilling destiny that you want, if you've ever dreamt of ever being at Google or whatever it is, what exactly is happening at each stage that allows you to be able to succeed? And how does it all come together is the kind of overall thesis of the book. So I touch upon this idea, for example, which is you know that all the things that people talk about biological determinism, for example. Are you born with your talents? Or do, is it part of your environment that actually teaches you? What does the science suggest? How does it affect me personally? How, how do I think that my illiterate parents, who were never formally educated, are a part of who I am now? And actually, does it mean that your intelligence can be measured by way of sort of formal education as opposed to informal education and life lessons? And does it mean that your destiny is determined purely by virtue of the fact that you may or may not be born to people who actually know how to read and write, for example? It's quite controversial, but I tackle it in the book. The answer is more or less it's 50-50. But equally, you may be born with some talent but your environment may well suppress it. You may be born with very little talent, but the right environment might really, really accentuate that and make you push whatever little talent you were born with to a level that it goes to. Where the way I put it is, how do you make sure that somebody's environment doesn't determine their destiny in the same way as somebody's environment manages to protect them from their destiny? And that's the best way to look at the nature and nurture debate in that context. Education. How many of you guys have heard governments, politicians, ministers always say, education's the answer? Education, education, education. If you just get them to school and they know how to write and get a university degree, they will be fine. How many times do you always hear that? You hear that so many times. Well, I've got a news flash for you. The idea that education is the answer, or even the main answer, to the conundrum of social mobility is nonsense. Complete and utter nonsense. And I'll tell you why. Education, for education's sake, is fundamental to the human progress. You need to learn how to be literate and numerate and be able to communicate and be able to understand people. You need to be able to read a bank statement. You need to be able to fill out forms. You need to be able to understand you know, the mechanics of communicating with human beings, both in writing and in speaking. Of course, that's a given. But the idea that more exams and more degrees and more qualifications it necessarily equals a trajectory in which you will become socially mobile, it just doesn't follow. It doesn't follow. And, and we've got to tackle that head on because the consequence of not tackling that is putting pressure on our education system. It's putting pressure on, on our teachers. It's putting crazy pressure on the kids. And it's putting forward unrealistic expectations on parents who are desperately trying to do what they can for their children. And I set that out, what that means in the book. And then when you translate that 
into what that looks like. Take this example that was found in, um, uh, by uh, a couple of academics at the London School of Economics, Sam Friedman and, and Daniel Lorison, who wrote a book called um, The Class Ceiling. They looked at two individuals and, took and, and, and made sure they controlled for degree classification, the subject that they studied, the kind of university they went to, and then the kind of entry job that they had. The only difference between these two people is that one went to a state school and one went to a private school. Everything else is being controlled for, okay? When they get into that same entry job, it turns out that the person who went to private school within three and a half years is earning 16% more. How do you account for that? These are two individuals who more or less had the exact same trajectory when you control for everything else except for what school they went to. And yet, three and a half years later, one is earning 16% more based on what school they went to. How do you explain that if education, and especially tertiary education, was supposed to be this great equalizer, was supposed to be this moment that everybody becomes equal in terms of equality of opportunity? Again, there are no easy answers to this, but I delve into it and I try and figure out what it could mean. And what are the kind of unwritten rules, the social capital, connections, the cultural capital, how you understand the culture in which you're going into, the barrister profession, where I am now as a barrister. Cultural capital is huge. You know, being able to understand how people communicate when they talk about what school and what college you went to, rather than saying, what did you study they will say, what did you read? And that's the kind of lingo that Oxbridge types will understand and maybe others wouldn't. And that cultural capital can make a difference. And again, what does that mean if we keep banging on about the fact that education is the answer? Another big theme in the book is the role of luck. How many of you guys believe you're lucky in life? Okay. And for those of you who don't put your hand up, do you think it's all you put your hand up? You worked hard to be here. One person, that's good. I hope you, you're being ironic. Because uh, if you're not, you really need to read the book. <laughs> Luck is important because especially successful people tend to tell a story that it's all them, that they worked hard, that it was all down to them. And I give about four or five examples of that but I'll share with you two examples. Jeff Bezos, and I'm not, am I allowed to mention uh, the names of, uh, <laughs> uh, of competitor organizations? <laughs> Jeff Bezos uh, talks about, and many of the, the sort of founding you know, fathers or individuals who start up tech companies always tell this story of, I founded my company in a garage. You know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it was in my garage. I sat there and I worked hard and it, was, it came together. You know, this, this nonsense that they tell people about it all began in this garage. Have you seen that image of Jeff Bezos sitting in his garage with, with Amazon written on fountain pen and, uh, and sitting there hunched in front of his computer and he built this billion dollar? Well, here's the footnote. The footnote is in 1995, Jeff Bezos' parents gave him $250,000 for free to start up his company. And all of the connections and people that he needed to know and all of the things that he needed to push to be where he is. And of course, things picked up in a way that has been exponential and arguably in a way that we will never see happen again in the way that it happened at that particular moment in time. Now, if that's not lucky, I don't know what is. But that's not the story we tell, right? That's not the story we tell. The story we tell is he worked hard in this garage and look at this guy now. He deserves to be there. And the reason why that's a problem is because we set then unrealistic expectations about what success looks like. We then set people up for failure. We then tell people the kind of stories that I consider to be irresponsible when it comes to people's <coughs> expectations of what they're worth, 
of what's possible and what's probable in your set of circumstances. And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about in the book and I try and lay out. Another example is Bill Gates, who we all know about how he came about, but the, the natural stories he dropped out of Harvard and you know, he's amazing, look at him now. What they don't tell you is that he's one of the very few people who had access to the early computer in a way that was unprecedented and learnt hours and hours and hours of coding and programming and being able to do it in such a way that his parents in that context, in that environment in Seattle, allowed for him to grow in a way that again, arguably, we'll never see again. But when you hear about his story, you hear he dropped out of Harvard, right? Dropouts are good, dropouts can succeed too. I won't get to um, the, the big guys of your <laughs> uh, that's for another, another time, don't bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> but luck, luck is an example, uh, the way uh, there's a really good professor, uh, briefly I'll mention um, by the name of uh, uh, Robert Frank at Cornell University, who's written a really fantastic book about luck, success and luck. And the way he describes luck is actually, uh, interestingly, Kate and I were talking about bikes earlier in a different context, but you're riding a bicycle. And when you're riding your bicycle and you're riding it really strongly and the wind is blowing at you, you're fully aware of the wind because it's pushing at you. You're like struggling, your, your, your feet are pedaling away, you're feeling that the wind, that current is pushing back at you. That's you being fully aware of your bad luck because it's there, it's, it's constant, it's consistent. But say you take a left, and now you're going downhill in a slight incline, and now the wind is in your back, and you're cycling fast and you're flying, you will only notice that the wind is in your back and you're on the incline for the first 10 seconds. After that, you're more likely to say, it's all me. You're much more likely to say, it's all me, because look how fit I am. That's you hardly ever noticing good luck. You will always be aware of bad luck but you're less likely to notice good luck. And again, I set that out in the book. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm no shrinking violet. I do think I'm special too. <laughs> and I don't wanna you know, undermine my own talents and what I'm good at, but it would be a complete nonsense and a folly to not acknowledge <clears throat> the number of times I've had help, the number of mentors who've shown me the way, the number of second chances I've had, the number of opportunities that people have given me, that I then recognized, that I then worked on, that I then pushed. And that's important because otherwise, another different story is both irresponsible and sets people up for failure. That's another, you know, it's really important that I impart that to you. The next themes in the book are in relation to concepts like confidence. Where does this idea of confidence come from? What does it take for you to be confident enough to be in a room like this and address people and, and talk in a big meeting and hold your own and be confident? What does that actually look like? What does it taste like? How do you teach it? Can you teach it? Can you learn it? Can you unlearn it? What are the kind of contexts that give it a boost? And what are the kind of contexts that undermine it? It's all there, I, I delve into that. Imagination is another chapter which is about this idea that if you're coming from, you know, one of the most deprived areas uh, of the country and you have never met a barrister or a programmer or somebody who works in, in an environment that you hope to aspire to one day, how do you have the imagination to, first of all, picture yourself there and then actually work towards it? How does that happen? It's a, it's a, it's a big question and I try and tackle it. And then there's another question, which is often uh, quite controversial, and I, and I get um, uh, in trouble for it. This is a country in particular. How many of you guys grew up in the UK, just out of interest? Good. So those of you who grew up in the UK will recognize this instantly, perhaps less so the ones who didn't, but you might recognize it now that you're living here more. This is a country that is obsessed with a lot of things, but one of the things that it is really deeply obsessed with is accents. <laughs> and how you speak and how you communicate can in so many ways 
determine whether or not you will be successful in this country, despite what your qualifications show and despite how competent you might be and despite how gifted you might be. I am not ashamed of saying it. English is my third language. I didn't speak like this when I was growing up and my accent has undoubtedly changed. I speak in different ways, depending on different languages, depending on who I'm talking to, depending on where I am, and depending on what I'm trying to achieve. That's the reality of understanding the world as it is, rather than the world as you would like it to be. And so if it occurs to you, very early on in your life, it turns out that they say that it's very hard for you to change your accent after the age of 25, so, so some of you it's too late. <laughs> so don't worry about it. <laughs> if very early on it occurs to you that this is a fundamental issue, for example, not me saying this, but the statistics show that if you have a Scouser accent from Liverpool, a Geordie accent from, from uh, uh, Newcastle uh, or the Northeast, or a Brummie accent from Birmingham and the black country, you will be significantly and disproportionately discriminated against. 28% of people believe that they have been discriminated against based on their accents. And they are right, because 80%, 80% of employers say they have discriminated against people during interviews based on their accents. Now, if you're faced with that kind of fact, do you still keep your accent or do you change how you speak? I'll ask a different question. How many of you still speak how you spoke when you were 15? Put your hand up. Exact same how you spoke when you were 15? Two people out of the rest of the other people who are in this room. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. You guys might have said the, the same. Uh, ish. ish. <laughs> For me, if you still speak in that accent, I would argue that, that that suggests that in some ways that you were born into a particular accent that allows you to be able to keep it in one way or another. It has to be. And those who say to you, oh, you're changing and you're not being yourself, you're being in inauthentic, just be yourself, it's guff, it's nonsense. It sets you up for failure. And I am not ashamed of saying so. You just gotta read the book. Now. <laughs> The last thing I'd add is there's a lot more you know, about uh, employment, what employers should be doing, how to improve uh, uh, employment practices, and, you know, and just generally about my reflections of how and where things are going. I thought I'd read for you then a slight uh, uh, short bit in the book before we open it up to question and answer. I've spoken for a bit longer. I hope this is not single use. Um, good. I like it. Um, I'll read you this small passage here um, that is just sort of encapsulates the book in, in a nutshell uh, for you so that when you are reading it, you can kind of more or less know uh, what it's about based on this bit here. The reality remains that for a young refugee boy who buried his father at the age of nine, arrived in Britain without his mother and was brought up in poverty and among profound deprivation, the chances that you would be writing a book like this one are minuscule, not impossible, but highly improbable. In that context, what politicians should really be saying is this. The chance of you succeeding in Britain today is down to many factors. The wealth and profession of your parents, the kind of school you attended, your mental and physical health, and the quality of your early environment in terms of stability and attention. You'll need to work harder than you have ever imagined and hope that whatever talents you have, given the fast-paced pa fast development of automation, you are still going to be needed when you grow up. You will need a lot of luck as you go, and let's hope that along the way, someone explains to you the, written, uh, the unwritten rules of the world you want to join. And you'll need to make it through all of that with your belief in yourself and your vision in your future still intact. And then, maybe you'll make it. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's certainly better than people that say when we live in a meritocratic society. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so
open you up to questions. I'm going to ask mine first, for I am selfish. Please wait until you have the mic, because it is needed for the video. So my question, which I, I know the answer, but I also would like to hear the detail behind it, is so would a child arriving from a similar situation now to Britain have a better experience than you, or a worse experience? And why it's, a, that it's a very good question. A child arriving today would almost certainly not have the, 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 be the best experience that they might have had when I was growing up, partly because um, things have hardened in society these days. I don't think we've become more racist or more intolerant. I personally don't think we have. I think we've more or less been as racist and as intolerant as normal. It's just we're more aware of it now because of social media and all of the things that are out there. So in some ways, I think it's harder because it's all in your face and it can be quite demoralizing. But I think your life is easier because now more than ever, we're more aware generally. Now, that doesn't mean that we're more aware because people are aware because they're kind of curious. I think we're more aware because the information is out there. The, the data is out there. The opportunities are out there. People are talking about this issue. Everywhere I go, everyone's talking about diversity and inclusion and diversity and all this, that, and the other. Now, I talk about the book how a lot of organizations are doing this in a very cat-handed way, and actually some of them are causing more damage than good, but at least it's out there. At least we're talking about it. And I gave an interview to The Guardian, or, or The Observer, I can't remember, where I said in the book, I said in that interview, I said, I wish I had a book like this, where I'm talking about what it feels like to be growing up lonely, without information, without data, without understanding how to sort out my homelessness situation, without getting somebody to help you with an application form, or how do, you know, just anything, any sort of information out there, how do we find it? So in a way, things are worse because of, of the kind of climate that we're living in, but actually things are a lot better because of the fact that so much of this information now is available to you in a way that it's never been before. Hi, thanks, Hashi. This is an incredible story. Um, I, a lot kind of resonates a little bit with with some of the stuff that I've got for. I, I, I guess it's advice, really. So people like from my community come and they say, look, you know, how do I crack this puzzle of British society? How do I? And then now you can say to them, buy this book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and what you've articulated really well is is like the facts of life, All right? And so I struggle sometimes with like what I would aspire the culture to be versus what the culture actually is. Mm. And perhaps what my experience was is perhaps not the experience that you Absolutely. will be having. Um, so I can give the experience that. So my question, I suppose, is like, how do we, you know, give advice without being too cynical or too, you know, perhaps it's changed? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a very good question because it, it, my experience growing up as a, 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 you know, as a young black kid with a Muslim name is not going to be the same as a young Asian kid growing up in in a city, London, in similar or worse set of circumstances, right? And for me, the best advice I I tell them, and, and there is some cynicism in that, is that it re it's really, really basic and it's really fundamental. It is critical that you treat the world as you find it rather than some utopia of what you hope it to be. And the sort of advice that people give, especially in my profession, that just be yourself, you'll be fine. It is such poisonous crap that for somebody who doesn't have the information, the wherewithal, the understanding, the context, the ability to actually question that, it is such poison for you. Because what then happens is that you be yourself without understanding that the world doesn't work like that. And pretty soon you get to a point where you're in conflict with yourself. Because when you realize that the world doesn't accept you as you are, where are you going to turn to? Because what you've been told to believe is be yourself because the world is fair and you'll be fine. Because soon when you realize that doesn't work, but you still believe the world is fair, then the logical conclusion is that the world that is fair 
won't accept me for who I am. And that's the trouble. And so you have to be cynical in that you have to understand that the world as it is, rather than as we would like it to be, isn't the same thing. But then the question then becomes, when you do make it, and when you do get to the point where you are successful, whatever success looks like for you, it is important that you tell a responsible story of your rise. And that's what I'd like to say I'm doing now, is, yeah, I knew my, what I was worth. I know what my talents are worth. I knew that if I sat the same exams at the bar school, if I, I knew if I did the same uh, assessments when I was being interviewed to be a barrister, that I'd be a, as good as anyone else. But what I didn't know was if I walk into a, a room and one of the softer skills is that, you know, did you get to see Richard III's performance last weekend? Or, 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 or which is the, the longest Shakespearean play? It turns out it's Hamlet. And you don't have that kind of cultural capital that you didn't learn in inner city London, that kind of feel that people have in a profession like mine, where we all do, it's not just my profession, every profession, people recruit in their own image. You recruit with people like us. You recruit in a way of, do I like this person? Can I work with this person? Dare I say it happens right here. And so when you realize that, and you realize that it's not just about your grades, although that's a good start, it's not just about your performance and competence, but it's a lot what, what, what sociologists call the homophily, which is the idea of you recruiting people who are just like you because you are effectively then creating a tribe. Once you appreciate that, that's the key. And so the ideal world is I'd like to think, for example, just on the point about accents, of course I'd like to live in a world where people judge me based on what I have to say rather than how I have to say it. But when you realize that there is a deeper social conditioning that means that what I have to say will basically become muted after the first couple of words and they've heard you speak in a particular accent, you'd be mad to ignore that. You'd be mad. That's my view. People might disagree, but that's my view. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your story with us. It's fascinating. And uh, I mean, your point, it's, I think it's a very good point, and I'm just struggling with it a little bit because I, I've been here for just over a year, and I am a member of the Gigglers, which is one of the ERGs, is an employee group, and we work really hard as volunteers to make sure that people like me can come here and be themselves. And uh, I've always felt that at Google I can be myself. I am gay, I am Latino, and I talk to people at work about everything that I do, about who I am. He has a heaven accent, and uh, sometimes I feel the accent thing, and yeah. I agree with you. And uh, I work in the legal department. Um, I know that people like me, if they want to become baristas like yourself, it would be much, much harder. But how? Not, not the coffee makers. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my question to you is, how, how, do you, how do you change that? I mean, if it is so difficult, how do you change that? Because I, I, I think it's a little bit unrealistic to expect that we all try to become something else so that we can fit in. No, I completely agree uh, in the sense that it's not easy. I talk about it in the book. I say, look, there is a tension. There is a tension between saying you need to adapt to the set of circumstances you're in to be able to get on. And the tension on the other side of that is, well, how are we going to change everything when we're all aspiring to join this monoculture? Which is true. It's a very good point. I accept that. But then the, the attack, in my judgment, has to be twofold. The attack has to be on an individual basis and on a systematic basis. On an individual basis, I've made the choices that I've made, and I'm not suggesting that everyone else should. And on a systematic basis, I am putting the, the feet to the fire by talking about it. The trouble with expecting an individual to go up against the system is that you will always lose. The game is rigged, and as an individual, you will lose. But then, if there is a critical mass 
of people like me and you who are then hopefully sitting at the top table, slowly but surely, we will get some sort of progress. It probably won't happen in our lifetime, but we will get there. But the trouble of insisting that an individual remains who they are is to pit two different you know, individuals. You're, you're pitting an a giant uh, against a matchstick, and the giant will always win. And so I, I accept that there is that tension. Of course there is, but it's not reconcilable within our lifetime. And that's my, the conclusion I've come to. And the, 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 the final thing is that we won't be able to reconcile it within our lifetime. And the insistent that individuals be themselves with all that that comes with that is that you end up dying, dying what I consider, what I say in the book, you end up dying at the altar of authenticity. And it's not worth it. I want to hear if you disagree with me. I want to hear, like, come on, man. I want people who disagree with me. Because I want to write in the next book. <laughs> um, I'm, I was interested to hear about luck and accents. Do you feel like that's a particularly British construct? Because I grew up in Australia, similar private schooling system. I've spent a lot of time studying in Germany and Holland where they don't have as much of that. Yeah, if I there was, it does exist in Australia as well. Yeah, no, I mean, the Australian system is directly geared yeah. uh, from the British system. But, you know, in places like Germany, they're very, very, by comparison to me, like you have to submit your like high school grades when you go for a job. They try to be as objective as possible. If you were to say there's like 200 countries in the world, just for round sake, where would you put the UK in terms of like meritocratic? I, I did a quiz last night. Turns out that the UN recognizes 193 countries, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, the UK, the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's a very. Where would I put the UK? That's a very good question. So, so, for example, like China is known as quite meritocratic and very. Yeah, like, you, get, you got it. Yeah, yeah. Very good question. Very good question. I'll take that. Uh, another question there, and then the guy over there, and then I'll I'll answer three of them together. Yes. Um, you spoke about confidence, um, but I'm also interested in your take about motivation, if it's ever a real thing, actually. Um, um, you mean the, the, the ability to motivate yourself? Yeah, correct. Especially when things are extremely hard and if you have like concrete examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing is you spoke at the very beginning about um, controversial things that you write and trolls and like what is it about it's on twitter just people who, who who write to me about especially on the accent thing the accent thing is a big is, is okay is a big problem for a lot of english people trust me uh, right there i'll take the last one on there so a motivation on there and uh, accents in australia and um the question about merit meritocracy in the world i'll, I'll come to that Hi, um, sorry, thank you very much. Um, this may be covered in your book, but uh, my question was, 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 on, was an aspiration, like us as a society aspiring to be better than who we are. And I want to get your thoughts on that, um, kind of given the fact, given your argument around, um, I guess, accepting the world as it is, as opposed to as it should be. And um, if we are doing that, aren't we setting ourselves up to just remain just as we are or evolve slower? I don't know. Very good question. Yeah. So I kind of get to the in other words, if you accept the world as it is, does that limit your aspiration? Yes. Okay, good question. So just dealing with the question about accents, Australia uh, and even America in some, to some extent have borrowed a huge part of the, the class structures. It just manifests itself in a different way. Um, I'd slightly disagree with you in Germany because Germany has got a similar issue in one sense because actually if you're from Bavaria, as opposed to another region of Germany, there is a slight snobbery depending on which part of Germany you're in. So they have their own bits as well, but you're right in the sense that, you know, they are uh, trying a little bit harder. The only problem with the German education system, and I've been looking into this, is that they make people choose very early on what they want to be. So you pretty much, by the age of 14, 15, you pretty much have to decide whether you want to go down the vocational route or, or a professional route. At 15, I could barely speak much English. So the idea that my destiny could have been determined at the age of 15, you know. Yeah, but you know what I mean. And in terms of, there's, there's all these different indexes about where the UK is on uh, this thing. And it turns out that the UK and the US are right at the bottom. 
right at the bottom in that index of, of, of what it means to be socially mobile. But having said that, I gave an interview to, to The Guardian. My wife is uh, um, uh, Swedish, uh, and uh, she always bangs on about how the Scandinavian countries are, are super <laughs> meritocratic. And that's also nonsense, because, because um, what, you then, what you find is that the, the Swedish and especially Scandinavian countries like you know, um, uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, Finland is part of the Nordic countries, it isn't Scandinavian, they, they spend a huge amount of money on education and really training people early on. And so they make sure that by the time you get to 15, 16, you have really made huge amount of progress in terms of basic education. But then, when you look at what we call absolute mobility, in other words, are you doing better than your parents when it comes to the kind of progress that you make? Sweden isn't doing that much better. There's a really good book called uh, The Sun Also Rises, S-O-N, and it shows different surnames. It tracks social mobility through surnames, and it shows that basically Sweden is owned by about five families for a millennia, and that has just meant that basically, so in, in absolute terms, they're trying to galvanize and push people up. But in relative terms, I really don't think that Sweden is making that as much progress as people give them credit for. I'll have to answer these guys and I'll come back to you. Uh, on the question of motivation, it's a very difficult one. If you're sitting there working hard, pushing yourself, and then you have to get up in the morning and it's raining and it's cold and you just want to be under your duvet, it's not easy. And motivation is, a lot, is a something I looked into for the book and there's a, there's a lot in there about what's often described as um, uh, um, uh, instant gratification and delayed gratification. So the idea that when I was growing up, you walk around the streets and all the guys with the nicest cars are the drug dealers or, or whatever, but you have to believe that you've got to go to this crap school and get the grades and that one day I'll be something. That's delayed gratification. Instant gratification is just like, forget this. Why don't I just go there now and I can have that car and those nice trainers? which is not, you know, reality. So for me, what I argue is that you've got to find that motivation for yourself, wherever it comes from. My own personal motivation was always that I just wanted better than what I had. I was just like, I want to buy a house because we've never had a, our own place. We've always lived six to a room. I was like, I want to be able to buy whatever I want without ever asking anyone and just work towards that. You know, and, I mean, it, it was materialistic to begin with, but it's just that visceral feeling of being able to control more of your own life that has been that huge motivation for me. And I, and I struggle with it even now, you know, sometimes. You know, we're all lazy, we're all bored, and we're all like trying to find different ways to motivate ourselves. Trust me, even the most driven people have their moments. So don't ever believe that, again, it goes back to that thing about I dropped out of Harvard, you know, I started my thing in a garage. It's complete nonsense. We're all facing our own deep challenges, whatever that might be. On the question of the, of the challenge and the tension between accepting the world as it is and to what extent then, then does that limit your aspiration, my point about uh, accepting the world as it is isn't necessarily linked to aspiration. It's simply a, a, a question of tools. So whatever your aspiration is, keep it there, but don't expect that the world is gonna be kind to you, generous to you, um, nice to you and treat you in good faith <coughs> simply because you want to aspire to that aspiration. What I'm saying is you have to accept the world as it is because they're not going to judge you just based on your grades. They're not just going to judge you based on your raw talent. They're not going to just judge you based on your competence, which is what people tell you, right? People tell you just study hard, work hard, do the right thing, and it will come together. And what I'm saying is that's not true. There's a lot more deeper that you need to dig. That doesn't mean lower your aspiration. It just means that the route that you're going to take is gonna be a lot more bumpier because you're realistic about the world as it is rather than as you would like it to be, which is more likely to treat you to a, a, a sort of uh, instant failure. Any other couple of questions before we wrap? Oh, there's 
I, I, I've been told, I don't mind, you, I'm, I'm, I've got time, so if, as long as you guys have got time, I'm happy to take whatever questions. I'll take a few together. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, you said at the beginning that you ultimately don't think education is the key to social mobility, yet you yourself are a prime example of somebody that who's pursue, chose to pursue higher education and whose ultimate career and where you are now is a result of, di of that. So if it's not education and you know we're talking about young people that maybe don't have parents who can give yeah. them the best advice what is the the very, key very good question. mobility I'll, tool a very good question i'm really interested in your um definition of success and i um i i my hunch is that 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 and you know you just said about being able to buy what you want and you know that kind of sits with very much within a capitalist idea of success um Options. and how does that sit against happiness and yeah what is what is the measure of being successful or making it as you refer to very good, very good. lady there and then there's one more here i think yeah so i'll, I'll take those two and then I, I i i haven't forgotten no that's all right we can start there and then go there Actually, yes exactly <laughs> I guess to, I agree with you uh, on the one hand where we have to conform, but on the other hand we have to also push like um, HR departments to have a different system where they're not looking at like maybe you, maybe they're not allowed to look at people or listen to people until they make a certain judgment that allows those people sure, to get to sure. a certain degree. So I just wouldn't want to discount that. But I totally agree with you. What you're saying seems to fit in with, yet yeah, you've got to dress a certain way. It's not just accents. You've got to dress a certain way. You've got to, it, it's your mannerisms. It's all sorts of things. And I totally agree that you have to play the game to a degree. How do we best help children or you know, you know, children and teenagers? Yeah, good question. I'll, and then I'll take that last one. Um, to the lady there, this lady there. We haven't yet mentioned like inclinations. We talked about motivation, but I'm looking at it from a slightly different perspective. I work a lot with children with cancer and teenagers with cancer who miss out on a load of school, their lives. You, you, they can either, they've had a lot of bad luck. You talk about cycling against the wind and the wind being behind you. Their choice when the wind is behind them, sometimes they don't even want to be on the bike. Like how, how do you instill that inclination to be hungry to look for the opportunities? Because that fits with everything you're talking about, because you still have to look for those opportunities. So how do you instill that and in what you discuss in the book about yeah, that's a very good question. inclination? That's a very good question about inclination. So just starting out with education. What I'm trying to say is that education is not the answer. I'm not suggesting that it's not part of the answer, but it's not even the main answer, I would argue. Simply because if we see education as even having this relationship with social mobility in the way that politicians talk about it, we're setting kids up for failure. What I'm saying instead is that education is just one of those life things like breathing, like sleeping, like just peace, whatever, like just the kind of, think of anything that is just a standard thing that you do when you brush your teeth. That's what education is. The idea of constantly obsessing over then linking it to people becoming more socially mobile is where I'm disagreeing. And, and I talk about that. And the other stuff that I talk about that comes with that is exactly as I've sort of alluded to in the end, you know, the circumstances in which you're growing up in, the kind of uh, uh, aspirations you're exposed to by your parents, the fact that you can have a decent diet at home uh, to be able to allow your brain to grow and not have anxiety and not have the kind of jittery ways in which you're then going to develop uh, 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 issues later on in life the kind of things about mentoring that allows you to, the chapter on mentoring I is subtitled, um, uh, um, it's subtitled filling in the blanks. So if you don't know what you don't know, having those people around you to be able to show you language. So there's loads of other things I argue that make up the bigger social mobility story, but this intense focus on education, there was a famous uh, Tony Blair, former prime minister's uh, speech where he said education, education, education. Again, that was a classic example of putting the emphasis, in my judgment, in the wrong place. That's what I mean. So I hope I don't want to undermine uh, the, the purpose and need of education. Just plowing through a few of the other questions. On the question of what, what it means to be successful, you have to define that for yourself. And I do talk about that in the book. I talk about happiness. I do talk about not necessarily seeking out the kind of happiness that means that you are monetarily more happy, but rather that you're, you're happy and successful in the sense that you have pursued 
what you're good at and what you're not so good at, what you enjoy, what you don't enjoy, and, and the kind of things that allow you to grow as a human being. Now, to ignore money would be a folly. To ignore money and, 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 and income is just nonsense. Either it's nonsense or you've grown up um, uh, uh, you know, financially secure and independently wealthy to which extent it means nothing to you. But I say in the book, if you're going to try to be, a, for example, a lawyer, pick an area of law. If you're a socially mobile person, pick an area of law that will allow you to earn a lot of money. Why, why get obsessed over human rights and I want to save the world when you've come from a very poor set of circumstances, in that area, those areas of law, you're not likely to make much money and therefore not likely to transform the lives of your family. Whereas if you pick an area that does give you a decent income, then you can change your life. You can change that. Don't be ashamed of that. There's no shame in that. The shame is when you make it your sole central goal. Finally on that, it's really interesting how football, I'm a big football fan, is a huge meritocracy. If you think about it, it's raw, raw talent. And it's no wonder that a lot of the people who make it into it are just dirt poor. Dirt, dirt poor, most of them. And then when you meet a lot of these kids who are growing up in the inner city London today, ask the vast majority of them. Most kids, even if they're growing up in nice circumstances, want to be footballers. But disproportionately, poor kids want to be footballers. Why? Because it's the first opportunity that they think they can have through their own hard work to change their lives. There is something there. On the question of inclination, I'm not a scientist. I don't know what instinctively occurs to people, but I do talk about how much your early life exposure can make a difference to your inclination. So for example, if you're growing up in a household where every morning everyone's leaving for work at six in the, in the morning and getting up and having breakfast, as opposed to what is often pejoratively termed by different governments Working up in how waking up in households where the curtains are never drawn until midday, I think that there is something there about an inclination that happens on for a child very early on that then sets the tone for the rest of their lives. But if you're somebody facing cancer and lots of issues with cancer and, and problems like that, chances of your inclinations being quite there is very hard because you probably believe I don't know, but you probably believe and feel that life's giving you a pretty raw deal. And so why are you going to be more inclined to get up if you think, I didn't deserve this, and now I'm ridden with this horrible disease that I have no control over? So I haven't gone into too much detail, but I do talk about inclination to an extent. On the final question, I, I remember it briefly, but you're going to have to just tell me one word and I'll, I'll, it'll come to me. I just want to know the HR, the HR. It's a very good point. So the HR points is a really imp interesting one. So we have to do more to help HR. So I, did, I interviewed a lot of HR people for this book. And what was really fascinating was they said to me, actually, we had this amazing young lady. She was really talented. She was so good. But she had an Essex accent. We can't put her. She was, you know what she said to me? She said, I'd love to hire her. But I can't put her in front of the clients. So think about that. You get to a point where you've managed to convince the HR people to not judge somebody based on their mannerisms or the way they speak. But then the next, another hurdle appears out of nowhere where she says, but what are the clients gonna say? I can't put her in front of the clients. So then I say, we need to move towards an environment where if the HR department has decided this person's competent, then you should be prepared to put that person in front of the clients or tell your clients to take their business elsewhere. Now, what company is gonna do that on their bottom line? Come on. Come on, think about it. No, not many companies are going to be prepared to take that hit right now. But we're, we're slowly moving in the right direction. And the point I'm making is that what I'm learning in this process of writing is that every time we seem to find a solution, we seem to hit our heads against a new problem that we may or may not have noticed before, that has always been there, but has become to the forefront uh, of, of where it is. Anyway, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate that.